You're about to. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce to the stage a new friend of mine, an old friend of Heartland. He comes from Oakland, California today to share a word that God has given to him specifically. Our friend, Justin McRoberts, everybody. Good morning. Y'all showed up at 11. Must mean the Chiefs game is a little bit later. It's always an interesting choice to come to the later service as a football fan. There's that, that tension of we hope to get out of here on time. That's a, quite a crucible you put yourself in. The tough crowd. It's been, uh, it's been a minute since I was here. Uh, I'm mostly the same person. Uh, I'm, I'm the same height. Uh, there's more pain in the knees uh, than there was before. Definitely some pain in the shoulders. Those things are different. Uh, last time I was here, my son uh, was considerably smaller, and he's grown since then. I'm told that's normal uh, as a parent. And my, uh, I have a daughter. Um, this is the son one, the, the, the tall one uh, with the tie on. His name is Asa Jonathan McRoberts. I'll tell some stories later on about him. He's actually around. He traveled with me here in large part because he has these wonderful memories of this place uh, and of this community. And by place, I don't mean the building. I mean this place that we share in when we gather together. Somebody say amen. He just has these wonderful core memories of being at Heartland. He said, uh, he said to Dan, Pastor Dan yesterday as we were driving to dinner, he says, I think this is my favorite church, um, which is very, very sweet of him to not make it mine. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to process that. Uh, but he's really glad to be back. Uh, he's very, very happy to be back. You've not met uh, him necessarily. You might have met him around. He's, like I said, he's around. You certainly haven't met uh, his sister. With, this is sister. This is Caitlin. Um, I don't really almost ever call her Caitlin. I call her the bird. She's just the bird. It's a nickname. I'm a kind of nickname person. Um, we don't have to get into how the nickname came about. But because she's not here, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to who she is, just so you can understand a, the ways in which my life is a little bit different now uh, than it was when I was here last. So uh, she is a, um, a, a, a blossoming, even at five, she's a blossoming comedian. Uh, she really likes jokes and not just, not just like the kid jokes, like the, like the nonsensical ones, like why did the elephant cross the road? Cause, just cause, that's a joke. Um, it's not that bad. But she's begun to collect <laughs> jokes, like dad jokes from the, the, like, uh, the ether. I'm not sure where they're coming from. She, like, she'll say things and she'll crack these jokes. I'm like, where is that from? She's very funny to me. And come to find out, she's very funny to some of the people around us as well, including our neighbors. This happened three or four months ago. Like, she's five now. They had invited her. They have two daughters, old, both older than Caitlin. She really likes hanging out with both of these girls. And they were going to, I think it was ice cream or cookies. I don't remember what. Some, something to which she would automatically say yes. Would you like to go get? And she said yes. So they get her in the car and they take off. She's sitting in the back seat. And apparently, as they left the neighborhood, <laughs> as they left, they're leaving the neighborhood, she goes, um, okay, I would like to tell some jokes. So she announces it. She sets the table. Um, okay, I would like to tell some jokes. And they've been around her, but they haven't seen her like in full form, apparently, because they're like, oh, that's so cute. You have some jokes you'd like to tell? She says, yes, I've got some jokes I'd like to tell. Are you ready? She's very serious, apparently. They loved telling me this story when they came back. They're like, we just want you to know what it's like to be with your daughter without you around. I was like, oh, dear. And uh, <laughs> so from the back seat, she sets up. She asks if they're ready. They say, yes, we're ready for the, for the first joke. And she says, okay. <sighs> Two cannibals are eating a clown. <laughs> and the one says to the other, does this taste funny to you? She's five. Like, one, let's break it down for a second. One, that's, that's a really good joke. It's also relatively complex. I'm not entirely certain she knows exactly what a cannibal is. I'll be honest with you. But she gets the rhythm of it. Secondly, 
what a start. I mean, just to kick it off with cannibalism. That's where your humor's beginning in five. The trajectory from there, I don't know where you go. What are you cracking when you're 19? I have no idea. That's the bird. Uh, Asa, I call him the dude. Uh, he's this incredibly, wonderfully creative kid. And I don't just say that because he's my kid. He's creative. Uh, he and I have been playing music uh, recently together, which has reawoken my creativity. When I first showed up here in 1998, uh, I was mostly playing music. And I love playing music. I really enjoy it. But it definitely has, over the course of years, like faded as a passion of mine. It's something I can do, something I enjoy doing. His creativity, he's very musical, has awoken that in me again, and I'm making music again for the first time in many, many years, uh, which feels really, really good. But of course, creativity is never really about the, the specific thing you're making. Somebody say amen. Creativity is more a matter of how you pay attention to and engage with the world around you. Yes, that takes place in the context of music or paint or all the traditional spaces in which we say, oh, this person's creative. But creativity really is the hallmark. It's like a thumbprint of the divine on human behavior. We don't settle for, watch me say it, we don't settle for it is what it is. Oof, I cannot stand that phrase. But the places in the world in which people say it is what it is are really dead places. It not, it's never a matter of it is what it is. It is always a matter of what we make of it. Somebody say amen. amen. We are specifically as people who are in Christ never to settle for it is what it is. If that was the case, the world would look very dim and dark. But it is exactly the fact that in the depths of our being as humans created in the likeness of God, we take the materials around us regardless of what they are and we work together to create something new, to create something better, to create something richer, to create something beautiful. So I love his creativity. We do some of that in music. Um, we also, we do Legos a lot. Uh, I don't know if you're a Lego person or if you're, not that you're a Lego person. You might be a Lego person. You're just really put together very well. Uh, I don't know if you're like, thank you very much. <laughs> that was a joke the nine o'clock crowd didn't get. So yeah, you know why? Cause that joke sucked. Um, but there's a lot about Legos that I love and, and, and there's a lot about Legos that I, I've learned from. And I'll tell you a quick Lego story about Asa and I and like some learning lessons, uh, really mostly of mine. He was, at the time of the story, like somewhere around four or five. I don't remember exactly because I don't do math. Um, like I said, he's taller and I think time has passed. That's my experience. So um, we'd, we'd ordered the, this kit. This is, the, this is the Lego Desert Rally Racer. We'd order this kit online. We kind of shopped around. He's like, I want to build that thing. So we ordered it, it came in, and we decided that we would quite literally wait for a rainy day. Rainy day comes along, and we unbox the thing. And then he has this wonderful, he's, he's a systems kid too. So he, what he does is he, un, he undoes the baggies, and then he puts them all in little Tupperwares so that everything has its place. It's beautiful. Well, he, and, he did most of the baggies, and I did a couple of the other baggies. And we get, we get to start on this thing. And a, a few minutes into the process, we recognize, or we think we recognize, we don't have all the bricks necessary. There are 74 bricks necessary for this piece. And I think we only have like 72. We just know that there are bricks missing at the time because we can't move past this particular page. And I'm looking around, and I figured I blew it. Like, it has to be me. Like, I, I unbagged it wrong or something. And so we're looking around, I'm looking in my pockets, and like, I go back to the box, is it in there? And then if you are now or have ever been like the parent of a ch small child, you know like how much time you spend on your own carpet doing, look, just scanning for anomalies of any kind. I'm on the ground for, I don't know how, and I cannot find these bricks. Come to find out. Once in a while, Lego will put together a box and send out a kit that actually doesn't have all the bricks. They're just not in there. Now, come to find out later after the story, you can just tell them that and they'll send you a whole new kit. I didn't know that. I was impatient at the moment of our Lego disaster. So recognizing we're missing the bricks, my son does this very wise thing, not just for a four-year-old, five-year-old, just a humanly wise thing. <sighs> he breathes out. He puts down the bricks in his hand and he walks to the kitchen and he pours himself a tall glass of water and then walks back to the window where we were making our Legos and he sits down in the windowsill and just sat there 
and sipped his sad little water <laughs> and stared out into the rain. This is a very Enneagram 4 moment. <laughs> and just sat there and got sad. He just sat there and got sad. And I thought, that's appropriate. So I went to the kitchen and I got myself a glass of water. I sat down next to him and I stared out into the rain and I just let myself get bummed, sad. He went, Dad, yeah, bud, what's up? This sucks. Yeah, where'd you learn that word? <laughs> he sat there and he got sad because it hadn't worked out. Watch me say it. It hadn't worked out the way he wanted it to and it hadn't worked out the way it was supposed to. And when that happens, our hearts grieve naturally. When the plan doesn't work, and I'm going to come back to that phrase, when the plan doesn't work and we put our hope in the plan, we get sad. And if we don't give it sadness a moment, if we don't give anger a moment, it'll haunt us. Somebody say amen. So here's part of what I learned. If I don't give grief and anger their own time and space, they will take it from someplace else. Somebody say amen. It's part of being human is that things don't work the way we want them to and they do not work the way they were planned or the way we were told they were going to. It happens all the time. So here's where I'm going to come back to like when the plan doesn't work. You probably know this already. No plan actually works at 100% ever. I mean ever. There's never been a plan. There's never been an executed plan. There's never been a scheme that went 100% all the time. Everything fails, dies, goes away, or falls apart. Somebody say amen. Everything. And so if I don't give my soul space to grieve what I thought was going to be, what I hoped was going to be, and what I planned for. I don't have the capacity in my soul to move into what comes next because I'm holding on too tightly to what I thought, to what I hoped for, and to what I longed for before. So we sat there for I don't know how long. Hey, buddy. And we got, <laughs> he got him. Good dad move. <laughs> That was a great grip. I saw it. Like one-handed. I couldn't catch that kid one-handed because of the knees and the shoulders. Um, so we sat there long enough in, in our sadness that like it passed enough for me to like remember, you know what? Actually, I have all these bricks from when I was a kid. So I got up and I went into my, in, in my closet and I grabbed this big old bag of bricks and I dragged them out and I and sat down next to Asa. Oops, we'll come back to this. Sat down next to Asa and... Uh, and, and I started pack, um, um, you know, taking all this. This one looks kind of like that. This is the kind of same color. He's like, what are you doing? I said, let's, get, let's, let's, let's try. Let's see what we can do with this. I'm going to say that phrase again. Let's see what we can do with this. And it reminds me of this text that I just exposed a little bit early. At this moment in the scriptures, one of the reasons I read the Bible over and over again is because in different seasons, different scriptures will jump back out at me and teach me in the moment I'm living in. Somebody say Amen. Whew. Jesus Christ called 12 people to live his life with him. On the other side of the resurrection, these were not 12, they were 11. There were 11 instead of 12. Christ planned 12. There were 11 on the other side of the resurrection. How hard would that have been for the disciples, the apostles, to look around and say, this isn't the way Jesus told it was going to be. This isn't what we thought was going to happen. There was going to be 12. Now we've got 11. And not just 11 because someone went away. It's because someone betrayed us and we are hurt. How hard would that be? This is the way it's written in Acts. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. Look at this phrase. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. I'm going to pause there for just a second. We'll come back to it. Look at this phrase. They're not at all shy about saying this is what he did. He betrayed us. It's right there. And then the very next line is he was one of us. That's grief. That's hard to say. The guy who betrayed us, he was one of us. 
They had to sit in that for a while and live there for a while so that they could move on. For Peter said, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men that, uh, who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men. Look at their process. They nominated two men. They looked around and they said, like, this person or this person. Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, which is like placing a bet. It's like flipping a coin. And the lot felt the Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. Just, we'll just take a moment for Matthias here for a second. Like Everyone else was handpicked by the Lord God Almighty, and these guys are like, it's Matthias. He's like, I guess I'm an apostle. Should I get coffee? What do I do? Like, what's my role here? That's a tough spot to be in. But look at what they did. They took some time to sit in what they thought was going to be, what they wished, and they grieved very clearly. And then they didn't just move on. <laughs> they paid attention to what was around them. They had 11 out of 12. That's 93%. That's quick math. Thank you very much. 93% is a great score. 93 is like a better score than I got on anything in the entirety of my academic career. That's a really good score. You know what I do, though, when I don't get 100% in life? I pay attention to the tiny percentages by which I miss. Anybody with me? Man. We throw parties at our house all the time. You know what I get hung up on? I get hung up on the names of the people that I invited who didn't show up, and I wonder if I offended them. Like, why aren't you here? We invite 20, 17 show up, and I'm thinking about these three people the whole time. And if I'm thinking about these three people the whole time, I mean, take a minute, be like, yeah, maybe I did offend someone. But if I'm thinking about these three people who aren't here, I'm not giving my whole self to what is. I'm also not celebrating like all these relationships I've got around me. Somebody say Amen. How important is it for us to recognize this fundamental truth that what is core to the human experience of life is not that things fall apart, is not that things don't work out, is not sin, is not destruction, is not darkness. What is most fundamentally true about life on earth as human beings is that God is good. He started a good work, he's doing a good work now, and he will, rec he will reconcile all things to himself and finish this good work. That is the most fundamental thing in the context of which any failure takes its context. Anything that goes wrong takes context in a story in which the God who made all things is holding all things together and will reconcile all things to himself through Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. So what they did is what we needed to do. We stopped and were like, yeah, we don't have these two bricks. We have 72 though. That's a lot to work from. So I'm bummed that we don't have what we thought we were going to have. I'm really bummed about the two that are gone. That bums me out. But we've got 72, and I got a whole bag of old bricks from my childhood. Let's roll. Practice thankfulness. Especially when it's hard. Especially when it's hard. Because what the darkness will tell you is just stick around and pay attention to what's missing. No, no, give that a second. Give that a second, for sure. But then look around and see how ridiculously God has been good up to this point. Because he's been good and faithful till now. Somebody say amen. And he will be faithful tomorrow. Vision isn't about knowing the future. It's about knowing who I am in Christ and trusting that God has equipped me for what comes next. I don't know what business leader or what strategy to, like, taught the culture. The vision has anything to do with like, banking on your plans to work out long-term in the future. That's trash. It's not the gospel, and it's just not true. And if we bank our hopes on the things that we're building to last because they're built super well, we're going to end up sad and broken. Vision is about knowing who we are in Christ and trusting that whatever comes next, I am equipped in Christ for whatever comes. That's vision. Who am I right now? Who are we right now? Let's build something together. That's actual vision. And that's what the disciples did. 
Like we don't have everyone we thought did, but we got Math- Matthias. And he's like, I guess so. Hey, we've got Matthias and this other guy and let's go. Okay, let's roll. But they started with thankfulness. So Ace and I, we took our 72 bricks and we took the bricks from my childhood and we started building the thing and like we giggled and laughed and it looked like a duck. It literally looked like a duck for a minute. For a long time, it looked like a duck. I don't know how that got to that phase. And it changed colors and the shape was it. We're dying laughing. Just like I would apply a brick and he would start giggling and then he would take the thing apart and put it back together. And what we were doing was the thing we actually came to do to begin with, which is that we were together, working together, connected, he and I, my, fa- the, my, my son, his father, in joy because that was the point of buying the kit to begin with. And I got lost in the fact that I was supposed to build it to look like it's supposed to be on the box. But it was never about the kit. It was never about the car. It was never about the Legos. It was about my son and me and the joy of being in it together, period. That's it. So we didn't build the Lego car. We built that instead. That's not true. That's not true at all. I don't have that kind of skill or that many yellow bricks. <laughs> we built what we call the McRoberts truckish spaceshipy thing. And I used to, like the first time I did this talk, I was kind of bummed that I didn't have a picture of it. I don't have a picture of it. Because later on, like we disassembled it, built something else. <laughs> you know what's rad? I don't have a picture of it because the car didn't matter. I have this core memory with my son of coming up against something, working together and living in joy together. That's what I have. Practice listening. What I paid attention to as we work through this process is how much I enjoy him. I just really enjoy him. And that's why I invited him to build the Lego with me. And he really likes me. I think for another, like psychologists will say for another like eight or seven, it's seven or eight months. He's 12 now. So somewhere around 13, I guess that stops. But for now, no, he really likes me and he likes building stuff with me. Um, these practices, Lament, thankfulness, listening. This is what gets us through the sales pitch we were handed that it's about building things that last. Y'all, it's not. It's not about building things that last. It's about who we are together as we build. It's about building with him together, period. That's it. That's all there is. It's not about the artifact. It's not about the culture. It's not about the building. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's about none of that. And it never has been. It's been about building with him together, period, always. So for me, it was about him. Um, So that's when he was four or five. And last year, like I said, he's sort of reawoken my my, my love for making music. I love music, but making music is a different thing. It's a whole other sermon. And I started kind of playing around with songs again, and he's got a bunch of skill on the piano. He plays drums, he plays bass. He would come out in the garage while I was tinkering around with these songs, and he would start playing around with me, and we kind of got silly, and we started putting together these songs. And so he and I actually wrote this EP, the first EP. We call it The Dude and the Bird. That's the name of the project. And there are a bunch of songs on it, like three or four songs, four songs on it. One of the songs, yes, is about poop. It's a song about poop. If you're writing songs with 10 and 12 year olds, there will be poop. Maybe that's what the record should be called. There will be poop. Uh, And as I'm doing that with him, like it sparks this thing in me and I like making music with him. So I start tinkering around with like my own songs and he's hanging out with that. And he's adding these melodies and he's he's like changing up the rhythm. He's like, what if you tried the minor chord there? I was like, yeah, sure. sure." And like we're writing. And I I wrote a bunch of like my songs, like adult music with my 12 year old son. And I was like, dude, this is so, (laughs) this is so fun. Do you want to record this? He's like, seriously, like, like record it, record it. Because from 1998 till about 2004, like that's what I did for a living. That's all I did. I was a professional musician. It's like a key part of my life and my legacy as I made music. And I was like, dude, you want to, do you want to record an, like an EP with me and like publish it, Spotify, do the whole thing? He's like, seriously, I'm like, yeah, let's roll. So we start putting these songs together. We practice a little bit. And then the day comes, I pick him up from school and we drive to the studio. I booked like real life time with a real life music producer at a real life studio. It was a big, big deal. We pull up in front after months of talking and practicing. We pull up in front of the studio and I go to get out of the car and he's like, 
shaky. He's like, Dad, I'm really, really nervous. I'm like, yeah, I get nervous sometimes too. He's like, no, Dad, like I'm really nervous. I said, oh, okay, buddy. And I sat back down in the car. I said, what's up? He said, Dad, what if I blow it? Give me a sec. He said, Dad, what if I blow it? Like, I know this is really important to you. Like, this is, this is the, these are your songs. This is your music. Like, what if I don't do it right? Let me say that again real quick. Hey, Dad, I know this is really important to you. What if I don't do it right? And I'm not a great dad, but once in a while, and I looked him square in the face, I said, son, you have done everything right by just coming with me. Because that's all I want. I just want you with me. It's why I want to go in there. I don't need to make more music. I don't. I was done a long time ago. This is what I want. I want you in it with me. Period. That's the heart of the Father for you and I. Man, we get so tangled up on the stuff we're building that we forget what an absolute gift it is that we get to build with him and together. Somebody say amen. amen. He didn't invite you in because he's got this thing he's trying to accomplish through you. No, he invited you in because he loves you. He didn't put you together with the right combination of people so that we could achieve some monolithic cultural thing. No, he invited you to share in this with one another because it's worth spending time with one another so that you and I would fall in love with one another because that is all there is, is the love of God for us, through us, for the people around us, period. There is nothing else in the world that matters. And this is a time when that vision and that understanding of culture and of church very specifically really, really matters. Like I would, I could end with the kiddo story, but I want to speak into the, the moment as best I can that we are all living with. Can I, can I give you one more story before I go? So I think the moment we're in is um, unique. Uh, historically, culturally, um, not just post-pandemic, but the stuff we're up against as a people of faith uh, and as, as, as a cultural people of faith. And it's more important now than I can remember in my memory that we come back to the core truths about how to live in Christ together. So um, there's this trail not too far from where I live that winds through this park. It's not an official trail. It was carved out by people who were hiking and jogging over the course of years. And because it's not an official trail, there's this part of the trail that when it rains, the, the water, the creek swells, the river, the river swells, the, the, like it swells enough that like I can't jump it. And so I either have to, when I come to that spot after rain, I have to like either like slog through and get my feet all nasty and wet, or I just have to turn around and go back the other way. But I, I can't cross it from there. So um, this is a few years ago. I'm, I'm on the trail and I'm jogging. It's a few days after a rain, maybe a day or so. And I'm coming to that part of the trail where this, the, the, I know the creek is going to be swollen. And I'm going to have to make a choice. But when I get there this time, there's a bridge. It's not this bridge. That's a, just an image from the Google. It's like something from Middle Earth. Um, Someone had built a bridge, and not like a small bridge. It's a good size, like, it's like an eight-foot bridge all the way across. It's really well done. I was like, that's awesome. So I run home. I was like, Amy, you know that spot? Yeah, someone built a bridge there. She's like, that's so cool. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. So two or three days later, we go back out there, <laughs> and I'm going to show my wife and some friends from the neighborhood. I'm like, there's a bridge, and there's no bridge. It's gone. It's just gone. It's disappeared. And you're, you're like, you know that moment in, like, horror films where you're like, I swear there's a body here. Like, that was... That was that moment, but no one was dead. <laughs> well, it turns out the bridge wasn't gone. As we stood there long enough, we noticed like shards and pieces strewn about the edges of the creek. Someone else, just like someone showed up to build it, someone else had just shown up and torn it to shreds. And my wife said aloud the thing we say, like, why? Why? Why do people destroy good things? You know, there isn't a great answer to that. Can I get an amen? amen? But I know it happens all the time. Why do things fall apart? Why do good things fall apart? 
I don't have a great answer for that. And I wonder if that's maybe because there's, that's maybe not the best question to ask. So jog home. About a week later after a rain, I'm jogging on the trail again, and I come up to that spot, and the bridge was rebuilt. And some of that rebuilding was like the, the materials from the old bridge. I could tell like the old pieces of wood that was built into the thing, and there was new pieces, and it was roughly the same size, a little bit longer, kind of a different architecture to the thing. And it's like this artist <laughs> had come back out there and said, I saw what you did, and you tore down my work but I care more about building it than you do about tearing it down, so bring it, son. And he rebuilt it. She rebuilt it. They rebuilt it. I was like, wow, that's awesome. So I ran over the thing and ran home. I said, the bridge was rebuilt. And that'd be a really cool story if it ended there. But it never ends there. Somebody say amen. It never ends there. Because that cycle never ends. Not so long as we're alive on earth. We build, it goes away. We build again, it goes away. We rebuild it, we build something else, and that thing goes away too. Somebody say amen. So I wonder, thank you. So I wonder if it's not about building things at last. <laughs> I, wonder about, I wonder instead if it's who we become as we do. So the next part of the story is that I go back out there a few days later and it's gone again. But this time, it wasn't torn apart. They had knocked it over and dragged it like 400 feet up the creek. So the water like worked around this bridge and like now the whole area is this big, sloggy, disgusting mess. It's like, man, what a punk. So I, I start to turn around and leave again. And then like something like wisdom <laughs> got a hold of my heart and said, Jay, you've been watching this drama unfold in front of your face. Maybe it's your turn to get in. Oh, because it's one thing to be inspired by the story. It's a whole other thing to get messy enough to get involved. Somebody say amen. And it did, man. Like it, mud came up to my knees. I walked up the creek. This thing was so heavy. I mean, I moved it anyway, though. Uh, and I dragged, it took me like 90 minutes to drag this bridge back to where it was. Another 15 to get it propped up. And I got messy because it's messy to actually be involved in that story. It's messy to actually get involved in the process and the battle between creative and destructive, between light and dark. And I like the fact that I got involved because I, like I, I, I like that I'm actually in on that story. So here's, here's where I want to land for us before I pass this off. I think that is very specifically the moment we're in. The part of what we're coming to is that it's never been about building things at last. So I'm just going to say it straight out. We don't, we are not called by Christ to build things at last. We are called by Christ to work with him together, period. And in these moments when, and does it not on every other day, every other week, does it not seem like things that really matter are falling apart right in front of our faces? And I wonder if that could, we can take some time to lament what we hoped would be and then get into the thankfulness of recognizing what has already been established and then get messy and get involved. Because I wonder if that's the actual call of this particular moment is not to build the next thing that lasts, but to recognize the goodness of Christ established in me, to be invited into the story, to get messy in that story and to work with the people around me and know that that's the entirety of the story. You were invited by love to work in love with the one who holds all things together and to be bound together in that same love with those we've been called to and called with. That's church. So if you'd stand with me, I'd like to say a word of prayer and then pass the morning off. Jesus, thank you for these, my sisters and brothers. Thank you for the work you've established here in our hearts and in our minds. That in the process of, of building and rebuilding, of assembling and disassembling, what you're really building is us. Us individually and us together. This is your church, these beloved sisters and brothers. 
these beloved ones of yours that you've called in love, may they sense that love and may they be rooted in that love for you, for the ones they get to work with, and the ones they get to live with. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Thank you. Amen.